Now that we have a good knowledge of the chemical structure and some of the microstructural properties of polymers, I wanted to tell you a little bit about some examples of functional polymers. And those include photoresists used widely in nanoengineering systems, organic semiconductors, organic actuators, and polymer biomaterials. A photoresist is the key material used in the technique called photolithography. Photolithography literally means writing in stone with light. Now it's not exactly writing in stone, but that's where it comes from, the Greek. And in photolithography, you have a light-sensitive polymer film called a photoresist through uh, into which you project an image in light, a lot like when you're processing a film in a dark room, uh, like in conventional photography. So we start with a photo mask, which is usually a glass or transparent plastic sheet that's coated with either black, totally opaque ink or chromium layers, and it has apertures in it through which light travels. It's a bit like a uh, it's a bit like a stencil except that nothing passes through it except light and then that light impinges on a photoresist film and that photoresist film is either a negative or either a positive tone photoresist where the image in the photoresist film after development is the same as the mask or uh, and that means that the areas where the light impinged made the material more soluble so you can wash it away and then you get the same image as the mask. Or you have a negative tone process where the light that comes through actually hardens or renders insoluble the photoresist film. And then you, what you have is photoresist in the areas where you had apertures in the mask formerly. The typical positive photoresist chemistry, there are many different kinds, but the one that is kind of the, the oldest is uses something called diazonaphthoquinone, and that is a complicated organic word, but that material is a solution uh, inhibitor or a solubility inhibitor. And so you start out with this DNQ molecule, you shine light on it, that uh, turns into a ketene, I believe is the functional group, then that further hydrolyzes into the carboxylic acid, which is then soluble in base. The DNQ itself is insoluble, but the car carboxylic acid is soluble in base. So as light comes in and strikes these little uh, dissolution inhibitor molecules and makes them soluble, you can then etch out that center portion of the image, the exposed portion of the image, with aqueous base. Usually that's tetramethyl ammonium uh, hydroxide, so TMAH, and that is a, uh, a nice base to use for that type of process. The next type of electronic polymer I want to talk about is semiconducting polymers. And semiconducting polymers are similar to the kinds of materials that are used in an OLED display, organic light emitting display, except that most current OLED technologies are actually based on mostly small molecule semiconductors like organic dyes that tend to uh, tend to emit light that are that's red green and blue or uh, or white light you mix a bunch together and so the uh, the characteristic feature of a semiconducting polymer is that it has a band gap so it has a uh, highest occupied molecular orbital, also known as the valence band or the oxidation potential. And when light comes in or when charge gets injected, you get electrons in the band that's normally unoccupied. That's kind of like the pi star or orbital when you're considering linear combinations of molecular or, or atomic orbitals to get molecular orbitals. If that doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. Anyway, there's a band above the valence band uh, called the conduction band, and when charges get put there, they can move around a lot more easily. And that is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, and it's sometimes referred to as the electron affinity. Now, what does a 
semiconducting polymer look like? What is the characteristic feature? The characteristic feature is a lot of unsaturation, which means that there are a lot of double bonds and sometimes triple bonds in the backbone. The characteristic motif of a semiconducting polymer is this alternating arrangement of single and double bonds like polyacetylene. Polyacetylene itself is brick dust. You can't use it for anything because, well, Okay, I guess you can, but it's not. It's really hard to work with because it's not soluble in anything. So you can't print it, you can't uh, really melt it, you can't do much with it. So what you do is you increase the entropy of the material by adding a bunch of floppy side chains which allow it to be dissolved and melted and you can do stuff with it. So a good example of that is poly-3-alkyl thiophene where the alkyl group could be butyl, uh, pentyl, hexyl, hexyl is the most common, poly 3 hexyl thiophene or P3HT. And that material can be solubilized in chloroform or carbon disulfide or tetrahydrofuran or toluene or something like that. And you can print it like newspaper. So it's useful potentially in certain kinds of solar cells and uh, RFID tags and stuff like that. You can also make this material called poly 3 4 ethylene dioxythiophene polystyrene sulfonate or PDOT PSS. PDOT PSS is probably the most commercially successful conductive polymer. It's used as an anti static coating. It's also potentially used in proprietary materials used in organic light emitting displays, although I wasn't able to find any more information uh, on that. But it is highly touted for those kinds of applications, also for. Uh, bioelectronics. So there's a very low impedance that the material makes with the skin so that you can do things like measure electroencephalography or electrocorticography, which is inside the skull, or electromyography, which is like the action of your muscles, or other, uh, other biopotential experiments. And the cool thing about uh, P dot PSS is that it's permanently doped and by doping I mean it's oxidized into these plus charges. I probably have way too high a positive charge density on this figure here but that's uh, okay. Um, and it's counterbalanced by these polystyrene sulfonate uh, anions to make it the whole system electrically neutral. The next class of organic uh, electronic materials I want to mention is liquid crystals. And liquid crystals, you're probably actually looking through a liquid crystal display right now, unless it's an OLED display. Uh, so you see these technologies are kind of at the forefront of, of, uh, of optoelectronic technology and consumer electronics. So this structure here is, uh, the structure here is 5CB, 4 cyano 4 pentyl biphenyl which has a rigid structure which is this biphenyl those two benzene rings that are struck stuck together and then this floppy uh, this floppy pentyl structure which makes it liquid so the biphenyl part makes it crystalline or rigid that's called the mesogen and the uh, and the floppy chain is the part that makes it liquid like and when you incorporate this kind of mesogen into a polymer, you can make something called a liquid crystalline polymer. You can also make something called a liquid crystalline elastomer. And a liquid crystalline elastomer is a liquid crystalline polymer that is cross-linked in its stretched state. So if you stretch out these materials into uh, the nematic phase, for example, and you lock that into place by cross-linking, then if you, uh, if you heat this material up, the, uh, the crystalline domains will melt and you'll get a contraction of the structure, just like a muscle. And when you refreeze it, you'll get the extended structure again, just like a muscle. So they're highly touted for that, uh, that purpose. Finally, polymers are used ubiquitously as biomaterials, so materials that can be used to replace cartilage, to be 
the sites of tissue regeneration to grow bone around fracture. Um, and the key is that you can incorporate drugs into polymers pretty easily. The mechanical properties can be tuned to be quite close to those of biological tissue. You can have biodegradability, you can have decomposition into non-toxic byproducts, and these uh, materials can be swellable by water, and you can also customize them by 3D printing. One class of biopolymers or, bio, or polymer biomaterials that you might be interested in is hydrogels. A hydrogel could be used as a scaffold for stem cell growth to, for regenerative medicine or as cartilage replacements in joints. And they're often used in things like contact lenses. Those are good examples of hydrogels as are other types of hydrogel biomaterials that you eat like uh, Jello or um, or agarose based, uh, what do they call it? Uh, gastron molecular gastronomy uh, cooking, and uh, there's a lot of potential uses for those. So see you next time.